Hello everyone and uh, good afternoon. This is our noontime devotional for Thursday, May 28th. My name is Reverend Lee Sinclair and I am one of the ministers at Robertson Wesley United Church. We have been over the last few Wednesdays and Thursdays looking into the book of James and today is our final day doing that. I'm going to invite you you don't need a Bible, but if you have one, to find it. And we are going to be looking at the fifth chapter of this letter. This letter finds itself almost at the end of the Christian scriptures, our New Testament, as it is called. I use the New Revised Standard Version when I am doing preparation for worship and doing general Bible studies. However, it is always fun to have some different translations and paraphrases around. Uh, translation is uh, a science and an art, and so um, the history of translating the Bible is uh, thwart with good debates and some nasty ones. There are translations and paraphrases paraphrases are those things where someone has taken a good translation in their mother tongue and tried to make it either easier to read or uh, surprising and contemporary. There are folk who are working their way through the Bible to make it more inclusive in its language so that when the Bible writer meant all the humans on earth, it doesn't say man man used to mean in the English language all humans and that meaning has gone out of use and so um, as we learn more about the diversity of people that God has put in our midst uh, including ourselves we want to find ourselves in the scriptures and so people have been working to decipher where in the Bible are there times when we truly mean everyone, but the words, the vocabulary have limited meaning because of the way English has changed. This of course is happening in all languages. Um, I was at a event a little while ago where we celebrated a new translation of the Bible into a nuktatuk. And that was a huge accomplishment for a language that had um, not even had written form. It had been a beautiful oral language for uh, generations and generations and generations. And so finding a way to both have it written, um, but also to then have the Bible translated into a mother tongue of some folk. I want um, I. I want to say that the final chapter of James uh, is very much James. It's, it's a concluding chapter and it will bring up uh, the main concerns we have been hearing from him. So let's start on in. He starts again with an admonition. He is very concerned that those of us who are wealthy, those of us who seek a surplus of monies or resources, we are in great danger. James believes that those who are rich uh, can be more tempted to think that things can save them instead of being in true relationship with God. So thanks for being here today. Hello to Jane and to others that are able to join us. Come now, you rich people, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted and their rust will be evidence against you. It will eat up your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure for the last days. Well, listen, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back, by fraud, these wages will cry out, and the cries of the harvester 
have reached the ear of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous one who does not even resist you. A commendation and a condemnation that those things we have kept in surplus are just going to rot. That those times we have kept back something due to fraud, that is going to be heard and known by our God. God is keeping track of how often we have held back generosity. This also strikes me as timely. This week, yet again, we have news of a man being arrested for a nonviolent crime, which he didn't commit, and in the arrest being killed because of the force used by police officers. This story comes from the United States this week. However, this has also happened in other countries. And it happens most often to people who are different from whatever is normal. Normal being, in, for example, uh, the white police officer. And so someone with darker skin who had no choice over what color their skin was is killed. And so verse six, you have condemned and murdered the righteous one who does not resist you. Feels very poignant today. And so this is James's consolation to us when we are in the midst of realizing how much power the rich elite have. Be patient. Be patient, my beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your heart, for the coming of the Lord is near. Beloved, do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. See, the judge is standing by the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, beloved, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Indeed, we call blessed those who have showed endurance. You've heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. We are invited to engage with injustice in a way that does not judge individuals, that does not distract from the real issues by grumbling, by remembering how close to us and how merciful God is. To be patient like a farmer. To know that even though we cannot see rain on the horizon today, rains will come in their season. One of the unique things about James, this letter we have, is that it picks up and quotes scripture a lot. Not all the New Testament did that. Some say that James talks more about the things Jesus talked about than even Paul, because Jesus talked more about his worry and concern that the wealthy were not going to get it. They were not going to get how freeing it is to give generously, to know love, to be humble enough 
to ask for help. We are asked to endure. But remember, this comes with the other admonitions of James. So while we are to strengthen our hearts and be patient, we also are to call out injustice, to be generous with what we have. And at times, the only thing we have is our voice. The poorest people, if they ask for help and get a pen and paper, their letter means as much being written to a politician as anyone else's letter. It becomes one of the number of stacked letters in a politician's office. I always think of that little boy in Jesus' life story. He offered up his lunch, and Jesus made it enough. James' returns to the commandments often reiterating that the commandments still hold true for the Christian Jewish folk as well as the Gentile Jewish folk, uh, Christian folk, sorry. And so in verse 12, we hear his, above all, my beloved. And so here it is, above all, my beloved, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. One of the top 10 commandments we received from the um, early, earliest scriptures, which probably was some of the earliest oral stories that the Hebrew people told of this amazing God of theirs was the 10 commandments. And in it, it says that we will not give false witness. Those are the old fashioned words for it. Now, of course, this means formally that we shall not go into court and give a witness that is untrue. We shall not go into court and say, I saw him or her or them if I haven't. This also says that we are not to go around saying that some vows mean more because they are made in the name of heaven. We swore it by the name of our mother. Our vows are to always be yes, no. I believe James would agree that there are times where we need to say maybe if some conditions apply. But James wants us to be clear about our own boundaries, about what we truly did see and tell the truth, and also that when we go to serve a community, we are honest about what we can give. These things sometimes change. One of the blessings of being part of a church is that I get to see people in different stages of their life of faith and their life in the world. So we have people who serve for a time as a leader, as a guide, as a helper. And then they can come to me or come to Reverend Karen or someone and say, you know what? I'm feeling a change, a shift. Sometimes it's due to illness or something stressful happening in their life and they have less energy to give. Other times, these are the most exciting ones, is when someone comes and says, I think God is calling me to a new role, a new job. I remember the first time I heard someone say, the Holy Spirit tapped me on the shoulder today. We are surprised sometimes by what God asks of us and what God calls us to do. And in a good community, we allow people's yeses to be yes. And we also respect their no's to mean no. Not judging or condemning, but asking them how we can support their decision. James concludes his letter hoping that we remember how important prayer is. All through this letter, James has been reminding us Keep focused on your relationship with God. Whether you are thinking about your faith or you are acting out your faith, 
you must always consider God as your center. What are your God values, your core important values? And so let us read those words and then I'm going to, yes, I have it here, read the paraphrase of Eugene Peterson. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church. Have the elders pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of the faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. And so therefore confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being just like us. And he prayed fervently that there might be rain or that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain. And then he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth yielded its harvest. Hmm. My brothers, my sisters, my siblings in faith, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from the wandering will save the sinner's souls from death and will cover a multitude of sins. In his conclusion, James reminds us that as doers of the word and not hearers only, we are to pray constantly, praise God, be in relationship with others and a faithful community so we can call on the elders to pray for us, for any members of the church to pray for us. And in his final words, James, who condemns us a lot for how to behave, notes that the prayer of the faithful, that we confess, allows anyone, because we all do commit sin, anyone who has committed sin will be forgiven. Pray for one another and confess your sins as well. James's biggest priority, of course, for us is to enact our faith. And part of that enacting that he puts as his final words is to enact ourselves in our relationship in such a way that we call each other back to our faith. Now he has some pretty big words, wandering people, saving the sinner's soul from death. I believe that all humans are sinners, meaning we mess up. We hurt each other and divide ourselves from our true goals in life, becoming mature Christians. And I believe that God adores us anyways, God wants an honest confession from us. And God wants us to get up each day and try our best to protect each other, to pray for each other, to be in relationship with God where we can pray anything to God. I am glad for the letter of James. I sometimes wish he had put that line about how we are all forgiven our sins in more than one chapter. He has been very clear about the things that tempt us to act out of something other than our faith. He has noted that we must be humble, that we must think of ourselves as always ready to be corrected by God. 
He's asked us not to be rich, to give enough away that we never become blind to what is important, what is life-giving. He has asked us to bridle our tongues, to tell truth, to be honest. He's reminded us the power of the tongue, that the words we speak can hurt, can bless. And God has asked us to pray for each other and when in need to ask for others' prayers. Throughout the book, James has asked us too to remember the Hebrew scriptures, the Ten Commandments, the endurance of Job, the faith of Elijah, to remember how important it is that we have this whole library to use to guide us. I want to let you know that our next theme, starting next week, we will be exploring a bit more of the Hebrew scriptures. During these devotionals, I have at times focused on one book in the Bible and other times on a theme, and we've looked to where that theme is in the Bible. And that's what we'll be doing in June. We're going to be looking at one of the great commandments that we take a Sabbath. And we are going to look at the different reasons why the prophets and those other elders in the Hebrew scriptures, along with writers in our Christian scriptures, why is it that God put Sabbath center? How does God describe, live out Sabbath? And we'll be starting that next week. I want to end with the end of chapter five, a little bit of it. And I'm gonna be using the words from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase. Are you hurting? Pray. Do you feel great? Sing. Are you sick? Call the church leaders together to pray, to anoint you with oil in the name of our Christ. Believing prayer will heal you and Jesus will put you on your feet again. If you've sinned, you will be forgiven. You will be healed on inside and out. So let us make this our common practice confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. The prayer of a person living right with God is something so powerful to be reckoned with. Elijah, for instance, human like us, prayed hard that it wouldn't rain and it didn't, not a drop for three years and a half. Then he prayed that it would rain and it did. The showers came and everything started growing again. My friends, I hope in the coming few days, you will find opportunities to pray. Casually let God know what you need or formally sit down and bow your head. Sing. I know we can't do it together, but we still can do it apart, and God hears us. If you are sick and needing to isolate, know that you are wrapped in our prayers. If you are not sick and you need to go into work or be with others, and it is scary, know that we are praying for your protection and to absorb, um, to whoosh you whoosh you courage i learned the word whoosh from a internet sensation named pluto and pluto instead of praying for people pluto whooshes great waves of love and i love that idea i believe god is the waves of love that i am whooshing 
<laughs> to you. May the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding and the love of God that makes all things possible hold you, heal you, and keep you safe. Amen. Amen.